All right. Hello, everybody. Um, before I talk into a dark silence for too long, could I, could I get thumbs up if you can hear me? Oh, oh yeah. I'll we can. Hey, thank you, Yeroon. Hey, v Victor. Hey, Yeroon. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. And uh, so today we've got Fulcrit de Vries. How is that pronunciation? Close? <laughs> it's, it's accurate enough. Okay. Yeroon, Yeroon won't be too mad at me. Um, so uh, yeah, very excited to, to do some uh, performance tuning on Elm Markdown with Fulkert. He's already uh, done some really great contributions, kind of improving some of the low level performance. And today we're gonna go even deeper. So um, thanks for joining. And you wanna wanna say hello and tell us a little bit yeah. about yourself, Fulkert? Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I, I I work on Elm stuff a lot in my spare time, uh, like performance-related things. I did a talk uh, last year at Elm Europe on bytes and kind of parsing and decoding. Um, and yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what got you interested in um, performance and these like low-level bits of Elm? Because it seems like a lot of people focus more on the high-level parts, but you get into the low-level details on it. Yeah. Uh, like, I like that. It's a, it's a nice self-contained problem usually. So you just have, mm -hmm. you have a, a piece of code that is reasonably small and it's just you and the computer and, and no, no outside distractions. Mm. Uh, cool. And usually you can make some progress pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, is it worth, um, Pulling up maybe maybe before we get into some of the specifics and and dive into solving some of the performance uh, potential performance improvements here. Um, maybe you had that gist where you had yeah. some uh, some specific things that could improve performance. Is it worth pulling that up? Maybe. Do you like? I can find it. Put it in the chat. Yeah, let's do that. We are. Yeah, so this is something like I worked on uh, a, a bunch of modules for the L Markdown uh, source a little bit, um, just kind of cleaning it up in in a kind of mindless way. So it's also a very it can be very relaxing once you kind of know the patterns. It all kind of fits together, and when you make a mistake. Uh, like this uh, package has really good test coverage, so oh, you which, know. Uh, oh, you posted it there. Gotcha. Nice. That's yeah, smart. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. And I will I will share my screen now so that everybody can see. Right. Okay. So let's let's dive into this. So, like, it seems like. Um, okay. So we're going to be digging into to Elm Markdown and trying to do some performance tuning, benchmarking using Brian Hicks uh, Elm benchmark tool and maybe using like the Chrome dev tools to analyze the performance. Um, but like some of the high level things that you've found improve performance, like one of the main things you were talking about is just spending less time in the actual parser. Like if you can do something in just vanilla Elm rather than the Elm parser package, that improves things, right? Yeah, so so it improves things in, in two ways. So it, it is a little bit faster as well if you can use just a, a result. Because a parser can still fail, right? So you can't have a like mm -hmm. a, just a plain value usually. Yeah. But a result can uh, can help. Right. That's just because of the way uh, the parser is implemented internally. Mm. Uh, but also what it does is when you uh, use the, uh, the DevTools profile, uh, you get a lot more information out. So, gotcha. Like we can see there's, that later, but there's not like an yeah. extra layer of abstraction around it. It's like directly calling one of your Elm functions or something like that. Yeah. Cool. That yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's good. I think it's good to have that sort of mental model as a starting point of like the kinds of things to keep an eye out for. Um, Like you were saying, yeah, like one of the things you have in this document is um, 
let's see, you had something about succeed. Yeah. So we could just start with succeed. And there were a few cases where there's some like code that starts getting copy pasted where you're like doing succeed and then continuing on with a parser. So if anybody hasn't used Elm parser, um, you use this like pipe dot or pipe equals. Uh, here's a pipe equals to like chain on parsers. It's like, um, you know, find uh, a string if it matches this and then run this parser and then run this parser. It's just chaining on parsers and the dot one throws away the result and the equals one includes the result. And so, th so these two are equivalent. And so like, like we were talking about this eliminates like Elm parser has, uh, doesn't have an extra layer wrapped around it. So that's good for performance. Um, optimizing for the common case. So like um, parsers have this backtracking. Uh, succeed not needed sounds like a job for Elm review, Yarun is saying. Nice. Great, great point. I like that. I know uh, Folkert's been kind of looking at that too. Um, yeah. Opportunities for, for sort of automating some of these things with uh, at least analyzing it and, and, and marking problems. Uh, mm -hmm. But so, yeah, so Elm parser has the ability to, to do backtrackable parsers, which means that it can, um, a parser goes down a path and it, it can't backtrack out of that path by default. It's like committed on that route. Once it consumes a token, that, that token is consumed. You can't try another, you know, another route. Um, but, uh, if you do a backtrackable parser, then if it fails and gets to a dead end, it'll back out of that and try another route. Um, but you can write parsers in a way where it, it doesn't, where you don't need backtrackable. And uh, Evan's got something about this in his document for the, um, Elm parser documentation as well. Well, you, you can only do that if you parse sort of the same language. Which uh, Markdown is not. Markdown, <laughs> oh boy. Uh, no, so so yeah. we kind of have to use backtrackable. I don't yeah. I don't actually think there's like a way to not use backtrackable. Right. But we but can even at least then, make a few tweaks to minimize it. Yeah, I think even that is kind of happened, but mm -hmm. I mean, we'll see, mm -hmm. but uh, you can, and that's kind of what I've done here, optimize for what is the, the default case or the, the most likely case. Right. So for, for any kind of parser in Markdown, it's very likely to fail. Because mm -hmm. any particular line, like it's, it's very unlikely that it's in a code block, it's actually sort of unlikely it's in a paragraph, it's unlikely that it's HTML. Yes. So, Right. The failure case, we want to be fast. And then we also want to, if we have some sort of backtracking, we want to commit as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So that is what you see with the, so you have the advance of backtrackable, mm -hmm. but it only contains a very small parser. Mm -hmm. So only symbol token.space is backtrackable. Mm -hmm. Which means that yes. it parses a space and then it looks at one of those symbols at the bottom and if it doesn't find that, then it uh, kind of can unparse the space again. Right. And we could even optimize, because like the Markdown spec has all these special cases and all these, all these things that we can do to, um, to handle, um, like there are all these cases that can have white space in front of them, for example, right? So we could get you know, really optimize things there and say, okay, we're going to check for white space. And then we're going to do that in one common place, like pull out that common check for white space and then say, well, if there was white space, these are the types of blocks which can begin with white space. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, so all, all the more reason that like having unit tests is especially important for parsers because when you, especially when you start like performance tuning, if you don't have unit tests and you're writing a parser, <laughs> like 
you, you just can't yeah. you can't performance tune without unit tests uh, you and you also want benchmarks you want it because you want to make those micro optimizations which sometimes make the code harder to follow so actually some of the optimizations that that you've done some pull requests for have actually made the code easier to read so that's mm -hmm. just a win-win yeah. but sometimes yeah. you get into cases where it makes the code less readable and in those cases you want to make sure it's actually performance bottleneck first yeah yeah absolutely uh but i i just think also like you get better at writing parsers because mm -hmm. at first you know it has two new operators it has all of these sort of combinators and you just make it work right but but over time you yes. learn certain patterns yeah. that that are nice uh, and Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I think it makes totally. sense to revisit a parser like every year, maybe. Yeah. And just look at it again and, and you'll spot some things. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I actually find it uh, just in general with, with code. Um, I like to like write a test, make it work in a really ugly way, and then worry about making it work in a beautiful or performant way or whatever. But like once I, I don't want to worry about that until I've actually gotten it working, gotten the test passing. So that it's especially true of parsers, just like sometimes it can be so hard to even get it working, period. If you just get something working, it's way easier to iterate from something that's working to something that's more optimized or more elegant. Yeah. And I think this is even more true with Markdown, which is a, a very yeah. tricky uh, language or thing to parse. Yes. So getting something working quickly is, I think, like you need that to maintain or to, to stay motivated. Yeah. I, I actually, the, the most interesting, to me at least, um, one is the first uh, item of this list, which is token versus jump if, if you nice. scroll up a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I didn't actually, I only tested this uh, recently. But it turns out that if you just want to match a single token, yep. you should use token yep. and not jump in. It makes perfect sense because the um, yeah. I, well, I mean it. It, it could. It, it doesn't matter. It's but. it's opti It's more optimizable if you have the Elm parser could optimize token, whereas chomp if since it's calling a lambda, um, it's harder to optimize the lambda. And there's the overhead of the lambda. So, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like if you give it token, it can reduce the overhead and, and build in optimizations for, for that. So, yeah, it makes sense. Um, oh, by the way, Jim Carlson's saying, uh, yeah, there's no doubt a theorem that Markdown needs backtrackable parsers. Yeah, I wonder no about doubt. the theoretical properties of Markdown. It's like... Um, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's not something I want to burn my fingers on. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just, it it goes out of its way to try to make things more um, flexible. And that's like a, a computer's worst nightmare, right? Or a programmer's worst nightmare. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so let's let's get into some uh, optimizations here. So for, um, maybe let's start by getting um, like a benchmark of where we are. And what, yeah. what some bottlenecks are? Does that sound good? Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got this. Um, so in the Elm Markdown project on GitHub, uh, we've got a benchmarks folder. And uh, let's see. So I think uh, I just do like Elm. I think I just do Elm make source main. Yeah. You have to add the optimize flag. Oh, nice. super important. This is uh, this has tripped me up so many times. Me too. But the, the results can vary so wildly and yep. can be so misleading if you forget this. Um, yeah. Oh, by the way, before you run this, I think we should comment a couple of the benchmarks. Oh well, we'll see. Okay. They take a they take a while. Okay, let's, yeah, let's see what happens. Um, you can just open up that. Like, you don't even need a server, I think. It's just an HTML file, Oh, right? does that work? Yeah, you can just open it up. Oops. 
Yeah, in the in the browser. So. Cool. And it makes all the fans spin spin real. Yeah. Noise. No. Yeah. Plus, I'm running but, uh, OBS. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So it, it, that has a good reason, which is that by running the tests very often, you get statistical uh, oh, properties, yeah. you get certainty. Uh, but it, yeah, it's always a bit annoying because this is just long enough that you kind of lose track of what you were doing. And then... mm -hmm. So we've uh, we've got some um, tough competition against. Uh... Elm Explorations Markdown, which wraps um, the marked JS library, and it's based on regex. So it's going to be tough to get to that level of performance. But um, we're not comparing against that. We're though. not comparing just... anymore. So that's good. But uh, when I've run the numbers on that, it's uh, it's quite fast. Um, uh -huh. Although. I mean, to be honest, like you can render a pretty large markdown document and it's pretty fast, but okay. So we've got, um, we've got like a baseline. So that's useful. I can, I can grab a screenshot of that so we can come back to it and see over time how it changes. Yeah. And, um, so should we, maybe, should I, uh, pull up a performance profiler in Chrome and, Maybe we can like see what stands out as a yeah. bottleneck. Is that a good starting point? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So if you haven't seen and um, Julie, Julie, uh, Julius, Julie, is it Julius? Uh, he's got a blog post on this topic, Performant Elm. Part one. Check this out. Oh, are, are we having performance issues? Is it is it okay now? Uh, let me know if if we're chop if it's choppy. Sorry about that. Um, but I think it's for the for the package that it's already better. Now. Okay. I'm not sure. Good. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, you, you should definitely take a look at this article. But um, Drew kind of walks through steps for using Chrome to analyze the performance and find where bottlenecks are. So it's quite quite helpful. Um, yeah. And that's what, what we're going to be doing. So, OK, I'm going to hit, uh, hit record, start performance tuning. And then we're going to, um, so sometimes you can s like see a nice function name that tells you the, the name of the function or the package that's running some code. And sometimes it's just anonymous and you do your best, right? Yeah. So hopefully we'll get some function names that tell us some bottlenecks. Oh, actually, even if you get anonymous, uh, I think you can stop it now, by the way. Ah. Uh, wait. I feel like, it, are you, are, uh, Did it wait, already you stop? already stop it. No. Oh. I think so. It looks like it already stopped. That's strange. I didn't mean uh, to stop it. But, uh. Okay. Does this give us something usable? Let's see. I think you. Um, I, it stopped way early, didn't it? Let Let's redo this. I think you. No. Uh, yeah, but you can. I think you should only start the benchmark once the tests, the benchmarks actually run. Okay. Because first it warms up the JIT and it does a bunch of other stuff. That makes sense. Uh, and so it's always a little bit annoying. Oh, the perf and it okay. I need to open the Chrome performance tab before yeah. I do. Oh, and we don't yeah. need screenshots. Okay. Now it starts. And so as soon as you see like the blue lines, you can start it. Cool. And, uh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, like we wait a couple, couple seconds. Mm -hmm. Get a good sample, and it like yeah. exaggerates the, the things that are running multiple times rather than the setup stuff yeah yeah so this like this really exaggerates certain cases of course like you hit certain code paths with your benchmarks and and not others yes um, but usually you, you like get a pretty good uh, impression 
especially here because like one of our benchmarks is just a short uh, but kind of feature complete markdown document. Yeah, right. And so that should give us some good, good things. Cool. We're very slow. Uh, yeah. So we've got an so anonymous function. We get a bunch of anonymous, but on the right hand side, you can actually click on uh, where mm -hmm. it's defined. Nice. And so it yep. can take you to definition. Um, but the unfortunate part of, of parsers is that. Mm -hmm. The top functions are all of the combinators in the parser package. <laughs> they don't yeah. learn anything. Uh, that makes sense. That's that's like the yeah. Like if you could stop calling map two in your code parser dot map two, then your code would be way faster. Is basically what that's yeah. telling us, right? Which we can't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, there is one thing. Uh, like the parser package doesn't have map three and map four and map five. And those for for lists and for maybe they're optimized uh, in in a smart way, mm. um, and, and we can do that for parsers, which is a bit unfortunate because I think it would really help. Huh. So I didn't know uh, that the yeah. performance was up. Like if you do JSON decode map six, yeah, then that's more optimized than if you do map two, map two, map two. Yeah. Really? So oh. yeah. So cool. what Elm functions need to do is they can be partially applied. So they there's a little bit of extra sort of work to be done when it hmm. when a function is under applied. And so every time you apply arguments, it has to check like am I fully applied? And uh, you can kind of skip some of that work if you know hmm. um, how many arguments you're going to get. Fascinating. Uh, okay, so Yarun had a question in the chat. Does it does it make sense to performance test non jitted code, non JIT code? How quick does a function get optimized in the JIT? So I think here, what matters is how much work you actually make uh, your your JavaScript program do, because it will optimize JIT optimize uh, over time. Mm -hmm. So, but. I mean, I didn't. Uh, I don't don't know all the details here, but you can you can hear your computer doing a lot of work in that mm -hmm. warming up jet phase. Yeah. Uh, so I actually like I'm working on some stuff related to benchmarking, and and maybe there's a way to. Because uh, because right now what we're doing is just making uh, the JavaScript runtime work very hard, and then we hope that it jet optimizes everything that we're going to run as, as a benchmark mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. there, there might be a way to get uh, Node or V8, like the JavaScript engine, to just be able to tell it. Like, I mm -hmm. want you to definitely optimize this function. Interesting. Uh, first thing, too. If, uh, if we had WebAssembly, compiled a WebAssembly in Elm, that would kind of eliminate some of, some of that need, right? Because it, it wouldn't need... I'm not. Or I, JIT, I think. I guess JIT optimizations. It could still. You could still optimize. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. But apparently, there's like an insane amount of optimizations that V8 makes on your code using the JIT and all all these types of things. Yeah. Yeah. But that like WebAssembly does a lot more work up front. But I think it can. You could still optimize like JIT optimize. Huh. Yeah, that makes sense. One Interesting. OK, so let, let's see. So we've got um, markdown parser parse. That's kind of like yeah. the top uh, level thing. OK, so this is this A2 function is also interesting. So A2 is what yeah. Elm uses for partial application. Right. So if you have a function that takes two arguments, then internally that gets kind of wrapped in A2. Mm -hmm. And then if you give it only one argument, uh, the A2 wrapper holds on to that argument until you fully apply the function. Mm -hmm. So you see that this function has a lot of total time, but actually very low self time. OK, so can you explain the distinction between... So, oh, self time is the function itself is running rather than invoking another function? Yeah. Got it. So self so we should sort by self time? Yeah. Nice. 
that is that is most helpful nice. here. Cool. So then you see that the top ones are. I mean, I, I I remember that they are all kind of parser internal functions. Oh wait, that's not true. Like the fifteen thousand numbers are parser functions, and the four thousand numbers are uh, regex expressions. <laughs> You've got the line one. numbers mapped out in your mind. Nice. <laughs> oh, no, no. This is just because I ran the Elm, Elm Markdown benchmark. Nice. nice. So if you, if you click on that this one, is it might be string find, but it's, it's like some. Yeah. Oh, look, it's got a type annotation. Int operation task error float. Oh, this is benchmark related stuff. Yeah. Is that, is that what 4000 mapped you to? Yeah, four three three four. Oh. Huh. Oh. Didn't think it should do that. Yeah. Uh well should we look oh, at this okay. guy? Oh, regex replace it most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well now we go. Nice. Okay. So this so, could be something that we might be able to optimize. Yeah, it's a, it's at least something you can now keep in mind. Like, right. Okay, we spend a lot of time in regex, and then you have to ask yourself: Does that make sense, or does it not? And I think in this case, it actually makes sense. Like, first of all, that we spend a lot of work in the parser makes total sense yep. because we're parsing. Uh, we also use regex in a couple of places uh, in the parser, so that also makes sense. Right. Yep. And for, for people who haven't dug into the internals, uh, the um, so the main like block parsing and all of that is done using um, using Elm parser, and then the um, um, why am I not thinking of the word the inlines? In yeah. <laughs> is done using uh, regex mostly because. Um, First of all, it's 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 a different algorithm. The algorithm for inline parsing, uh, like I can just pull up the um, GitHub flavored markdown spec, and the inline parsing, like you can see, it's this it's this algorithm. I'll paste a link to it here. Um, an algorithm for parsing nested emphasis and links. By far the trickiest part is parsing emphasis and links. So when we're parsing inlines and we hit, so you, you start from the right hand side and you go to the left hand side and you, you look for these characters and when you, actually it's like a two pass thing, but you, you insert a text node with this symbol. You have a delimiter stack, which is a doubly linked list. Each element contains a pointer to a text node. When we hit this character, so basically what, what this is dealing with is the ability in Markdown to, um, to have incomplete tags. Like if in Markdown, if I have, uh, hello, this is an incomplete link. Um, Example.com. Then, as far as Markdown is concerned, this is a literal string. And then if I do this, it's a link when I close it. But um, because of that, Elm parser is not a good fit because it does all sorts of um, sort of parsing for ambiguities where it will handle them gracefully. And it, Elm parser is just not suited to solve that problem. So that's why it's using right. regex uh, for uh, parsing the inlines. Yeah. yeah. So if you think about how you would solve that, you would have to do a lot of backtracking because exactly. Uh, now, when you hit the end of the line and you know that, oh, I, I thought this was a link, but actually it's not closed, you have to go all the way back and start with some other parser. And that gets very expensive. Exactly. And it would also be extremely unmaintainable code because it's just like Elm parser is designed in, in a way where if you're parsing unambiguous languages, it's very nice to use and it can be very performant. But then if you're trying to parse something that's ambiguous and it says, well, if I find, if I find this token, then do this. But then if this, pre, if this token had occurred back earlier towards the beginning and you encounter this later, it, it's not designed to do that type of thing. So it's not, it's not going to be maintainable. It's not going to be performant. So we use regex for that. Um, and I, I use uh, Pablo Hirofuji's 
inline parsing implementation from his um, regex based parser for that. Um, OK, so where uh, should we see if we can find something that we can go in and, and see if we can make some improvements around? Yeah, so I think it shows up here eventually. Something something else of note is that we see utils update in there. Uh, yeah, now you have to scroll up a little I'll bit. I scroll up, okay. You see, I think you should hit. I think uh, I can utils update. filter for update. Let's see. Wow, it's it's not responding. <laughs> It's very slow. Anyway, utils update is the record update syntax now. And nice. because of various technical reasons, uh, updating records in loops is inefficient. Um, and so this is often something that you can very easily fix. Right. Uh, yeah, so... so the. So what you're talking about is like the difference between, um, like if I say uh, my record and I want to update last name, uh, then, you know, compared to like, this is like the name. It's actually more performant to do this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that, um, like, I'm not even 100% sure on all of the technical details, but I think this is, it's now possible to put this into memory in one go. And that makes it faster. So what utils that update does is add the, the keys one by one. So uh, an Elm record gets represented as a JavaScript object. So it's it's a hash map. Mm -hmm. So it adds all the fields one by one, and that makes it slow. That's what I understand. Right. There's ways to fix it in the compiler. Uh, that fix is not to just expand all of the record updates, mm. because that could really inflate the bundle size. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. If you update a lot, of records, uh, there's 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 some huh. other ways around this. Interesting. That makes sense. Uh, Jim Jim Carlson. Oh, uh, do you mean X XHTML strict? Any thoughts about it? Oh, oh, okay. Jim Jim Carlson in the chat is asking about a, a rational markdown, and I, I think what what Jim is talking about. Uh, we've we've discussed this in person before. Is just Hey, what if like some of the ambiguous parsing rules in Markdown make it harder both for implementing it, for making it performant, and also like as a user you don't really need those features. I think that um, I've definitely thought about that. For for my Markdown parser, what I've been going for is I want to give you the ability to take input which you don't control and parse it safely which means we're kind of tied to handling the spec but that said i i'm all in favor of a saner markdown to, to like split off from the markdown spec and and make your own simplified version i think uh i think it makes a lot of sense yeah i'm i'm all for that if you do that uh, i would i would probably use it <laughs> um might be good for your mental health yeah and, uh general motivation in life. Exactly. OK, so, so I think uh, I saw you scroll down a little bit before in the list, and I saw something that I also marked as we should look at this. Cool. Uh, so these are, um, these are functions that end in TTM. Yes. Also, well, you see the inline parser file name pop up a couple of times, so we see some mm -hmm. TTM. Yeah. Yep. Uh, cool. So this is the file that I didn't touch yet because it's, as you said, a little bit different. Yes. And I, I think there are some ways that we can really make this a lot faster. So do you think this is a good good one to start with? Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's do that. Um, 
Sounds good. Yeah, so like in Markdown, inlines um, are going to be, you know, like if you have uh, if you have like two hashes, then this is a heading. Um, but actually the stuff within the heading, like if I make this bold, uh, well, it doesn't work on my notes tool here, but you know, um, if you make things bold or italic, you can do that within headings. So even though this is a heading, it's inlines within here and it's inlines in the body. So most of Markdown is inlines. So if we can optimize inlines, then it has a bigger payoff. Uh, so let's take a look at this guy. Okay, so code autolink type HTML tag TTM. Okay, so autolinks are uh, autolinks look like this. Um, that's an autolink syntax with the right. angle brackets. Yeah, so um, something I noticed here is that this is a tail recursive function. Oh, I think nice. At the time you wrote this, this in fact uh, got tail call optimized. So what that means is that when a function calls itself as kind of its its final action, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. we can or the L compiler will optimize that and and turn that into a JavaScript while loop. Which means that nice. you don't have to call another function, and and function calls are expensive because you have to go to some other place in memory, and because every function has a little bit of space for its local variables yes. and for its arguments, and that has to be uh, allocated and then cleaned up later. So calling mm -hmm. functions is kind of, um, I mean, we do functional programming, so functions are very nice, but yes. they are also expensive sometimes nice cool and That's so great yeah yeah and something that changed in 0 0.19.1 i think huh. is that when you do a tail call behind a pipeline as you have done here that doesn't get optimized anymore aha uh -huh. and so that immediately means that something that was very like compiled into a nice while loop before mm -hmm. all of a sudden uh, is a, a whole bunch of recursive function calls, mm -hmm. which is a lot slower, and it can also give like a stack, mm -hmm. is it, is it like a range range error, right. stack overflow. Right, because every time a function is called, it allocates like the bookkeeping to say, okay, I'm calling this function. When this function is called, take the return value and then send it here to this code. So it allocates space on the heap and then it has to deallocate that and it's yeah we wanted to optimize it to a while loop so under the under the hood so uh so you're talking about these pipelines here it doesn't like yeah. this. yeah yeah so specifically uh these are like very simple changes if you take the final line of that block here so where it calls itself oh and just that up, Ooh, nice and, and yeah, like do some parentheses fixing, and then it cool. just works. Nice. And then same with this guy. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. And so uh, I think this happens in a, in a bunch more places for the various TTM functions. Uh, um, oh, maybe so... I can search for like um, like regex search for pipe dot star TTM. Uh, oh, is this? Do I need to escape that? Yeah. Hey, cool. Yeah, nice. And you have to make sure that it's actually, yeah, this is an author. Yeah, this is actually a recursive call. Yeah. Um, so that this is a recursive fun. call. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And so there's something that you can just kind of do mindlessly once you know. Yep. And if you don't, then there's there's 
no real way to find out. So. Line break. Why I, I try to talk about it whenever I get the opportunity. Oh, look, this is this is a double uh, double whammy. We've got a record update and a non tail yeah. call recursive optimiz optimization. So nice. Yeah. <laughs> like, also, before people start banishing record updates from all oh, of yeah, their programs, definitely. Their group, yeah. that's not the point because mm -hmm. they they are really much nicer to look at. Yes, and but it's something future to look release at for. could make that optimization for us, and it could actually turn out to be less performant in a future release. So yeah, it's it's really important to emphasize that what we're doing is performance tuning something that gets called over and over and over and over. So if we make a micro optimization, it's it's worth it. And also yeah. it's a package. And uh, like this also made, uh, like package code. Yes. Yeah. So so in package code, I like to go a little bit further than I would if others have to also look at that code day to day. Okay, so I got all the TTM ones. Um Okay. Nice. Function. Should should I look through for? Should we do a quick glance? Let's just go through and we'll see if I I can see any other return. No, that's not tail call recursion. This is token pair to match. Match. If you got those, then is that it? Cool. It'll show up in the in the dev tools. Nice. If it, if else is Seems like we we got most of them. Okay, so um, should we run the benchmark again? Yeah. Let's see. Okay, let's try that. I'll recompile. So last time, this is what we had. Yeah. So we should note here that like the numbers still fluctuate by probably like what we're looking at now is the bottom one. The what is it, headings and lists in the HTML? Because that is that has the most inline stuff. And that number can probably go up and down by a hundred if you run the exact same code a couple of mm -hmm. times. Um, so there's there's still error bars on that number, even though it tries to uh, give us statistical guarantees about that number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So it's, it's like it's reasonably consistent, but it it can fluctuate. Right. Yeah, I mean it makes sense because all of the just-in-time optimizations and things they're non-deterministic, and then what what's happening with your system at the time and that sort of thing. Yeah. If OBS is struggling to get out good enough bandwidth. Oh, um, Yarun is commenting in the chat. Oh, let, let's see our results, and then I'll get to Yarun's comment there. So, um, ah, this is a very interesting one. It, ah, yeah. See, I well, also like have like more tabs open, so I could have done something different with tabs. I could have like not had the dev window open. I could like. It's hard to know. I mean, that is really that is within the margin of error. So it's about the same. Well, on this scale, it seems mm -hmm. to be. But I think when we, if you run the um, the dev tools in a bit, those functions maybe have disappeared now. Right. Um, but Jeroen is making an interesting comment here, which uh, is that he sees a lot of the. Um, Double plus string concatenation. Uh, would a string dot concat not be faster? Uh, and this is actually this is not true. So the the expanded double plus is is a lot faster uh, because string dot concat needs a list argument, and that means that you have to allocate that list, and then and it, it, like it's a JavaScript array, so it can kind of resize, and and they have all sorts of tricks in in V8 to like scale up and scale down optimizations. Yeah. Um, but bottom line, like traversing a list is, is kind of death. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. 
Inlining your string concatenations helps if you do a list of all on like three items, three booleans. You should really write out all of the the infix operators. Mm -hmm. And and Yarun is saying, um, what about if we um, take away the pipeline operator for the plus plus? Would that be able to optimize? No, that, uh, that also no, that's fine. So the mm -hmm. pipeline operator is special case, mm -hmm. and that gets. Um, What's, it gets inlined, mm -hmm. so you can't ever see the inf uh, the, the pipeline operator in the compiled JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay, so... so the only thing here potentially is that you use the plus plus in a prefix position, which um, means that it and becomes a function and that won't get inlined. So. Maybe it's it's something we could look yeah. at. Interesting. Now I'm kind of I'm kind of thinking since it didn't show a noticeable difference, um, these TTM calls. Um, I mean, let's see. If it's taking 0.4 percent or 0.6 mm -hmm. percent yeah. of the total time, then even if we were to complete like best case scenario, we would get a 0.6 percent improvement. But that's yeah. best case scenario. But it's actually still doing work there. It's just a little less like like less heap allocation and stuff. Now it also could be that um, I mean, what is like what is this code even doing? Like the the stuff that we changed here, um, or it was doing like actually. Do you even have Auto links in your in the benchmark. Let's look at that. Yeah, so like we could totally engineer a benchmark that would see a good um, improvement right yeah. now. Uh, but this is also. If you make the document big enough, that would actually throw a runtime exception mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a place that you don't expect. So mm -hmm. we should fix that no matter what. Uh, sometimes the payoff for those changes isn't immediately obvious. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't, yeah, this doesn't have auto links. But it's still looking for auto links. So. Um, so has to look. For it. Yeah, it still has to look for it. So it like yeah, what is ta what is it taking time doing? Like it copy auto link type HTML tag. Huh. Interesting. All right. Uh, what uh, what's a good place to look next? Well, I had a look at the source. I'm not sure we can find it in the um... in the in the benchmark. Yeah, yeah. There is a function that I uh -huh. saw. Um, it's called find token in the same file that we were looking at before. Yes. Um, so I don't fully understand the code here, but it seems to be searching in a list. And the idea is that as soon as it finds what it's looking for, um, it kind of holds onto that item. Mm -hmm. Right, so, um, and it does that using a full L, mm -hmm. which is really elegant, but a problem with the folds on lists is that you can't exit early. So if you're done, you have to still go over all the mm. elements in the list. Ah, ah as opposed to tail, call, tail recursion, or not tail recursion, but recursing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I would... Um, hmm recommend that that we rewrite this as a recursive definition cool. instead of using a full cool. um, nice I wonder okay so this is um, this inline parser code like I mentioned before is uh, generously used with permission by Pablo Hirofuji uh, this was his implementation of the inline parser in his regex based 
Elm Parser. Elm Mark Down Parser. Um, I'm wondering if maybe he has like a test case for find token. So let me see. Well, I think this function is used often enough. That okay, we it'll know, exercise but, it. Uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, I think you're right. Okay. Um, so let's see. How do uh, how do you want to get started here? What's what's a good first step? Oh. Uh, Looks like we lost Fulker for a second here. Uh, might need to reconnect on Skype. Wait, did I lose everything? There we go. Aha. Uh -huh. You're back. Ah. All Mandatory right. technical difficulty. That's right. Always. Yeah. Um, okay. So find token. Uh, so you're saying let's, let's get rid of this fold L. So, so you're saying let's make this recursive. Yeah, uh, and an additional reason is that for the fold L, you can only kind of have one piece of state. And when we make this tail recursive, so and in this case, that's a, a, a tuple with three elements. And so we have to kind of construct and deconstruct a tuple for every element of the list. And when we make this tail recursive, we don't have that cost as well. So we can just give three arguments to that function and we don't have to do this this tuple business. Right. Okay, maybe maybe for reference we can just copy this for now. Yeah. So find token new. And you're saying this is the fold is folding with these three things. So you're saying these are going to be our arguments. So uh yes. So something I think, like I think it helps here to make a uh, something that Evan often does is the helper. like make token help. Yeah. yeah. Right, recursive, now, recursive helper functions. Yes, because that helper function is going to take a bunch of extra arguments. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so then like our public sort of interface is still the same, but now we can can also have these extra arguments. Right, definitely. Okay, so yes, I, I like that pattern too. Um, so find token help. And then, well, it doesn't like that I'm shadowing these names. I'll just, let me make it happy for now by doing this. <laughs> and then, okay, so that still compiles. We can pass it this new information. Um, and then we'd want, so instead of list.foldl, what is uh, what is return? Oh, interesting. Return is like as soon as you're done, we're gonna process the elements in in. Ah. So that is like your base case, and the search is the recursive case for this helper. Right. Okay. So we can we can still keep that, but what we want to do is we want to recursively call this, and we want to call it with this. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you, like, I think we can get rid of search and return over time. Yeah. Um, something we definitely need is the, like, the list that we were previously folding on. We now need as an argument that we pattern match on. The list that we were folding on. We need as an argument that we pattern match on. Oh, okay. So fold L tokens is this list. So yeah. you're saying this tokens list we're going to have to treat differently. Yeah, we're going to have to pattern match on that. Because if mm -hmm. we get an empty list, we should do what return is doing right now. And otherwise, we need to do like what is what search is doing right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's see. Um, yeah, what? Um, let's see. So find token, find token help. We give it these three new arguments. 
So shouldn't I be able to recursively call it? Why is it not happy about me passing it? Oh, it didn't, didn't take it, that. But search isn't the correct name. It's is token. It's is there. token. Yeah, it needs to take is token. But then we have to account for this. Well, I guess we can just call search where needed. Okay, so it was folding over with search. So you're saying we're eventually not, okay, so eventually it's going to be something like this, but now we're completely ignoring return and search. So we're not, we're just kind of um, infinitely recursing. Yeah, the yeah. performance will not be very good. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so we need to find our way to a base case somehow. So, so we need to call search. Uh, well, and we yeah, need to like split we off the tokens from the list, right? Yeah. So we were already doing a, a left fold, so we're not going to change the order here by just looking at like a, a, a list pattern match. It's going to look at the first element and then the other element. That is also mm -hmm. the order that Foldel would process items in. So, um, so you were saying we're, we're going to want to do some sort of case statement on the tokens. And like if it's, I mean, actually, we probably are going to do some something with return in this base case, yep. right? Um, yeah. Return. Now we need to see what names we gave to those three. It's not like, yeah, it's going to be those three. Mm -hmm. They need different names because we shadow. Or, mm -hmm. uh, you can use things like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, you're saying this is... No, it should go in the return. Right, so these are the arguments that we get from previous iterations. We have changed these three right. things, and now we're done, and we're going to kind of post-process them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then... So now we've used return in the yes kind of the base case and then we need to use search in the recursive case yes so search takes a, the current token okay so um so we can split off like next token to pro i don't know if next token is taken is it uh no okay so we want to process the next token using search. Yeah. Search in those three items. Sometimes I like to do like a let to just like get something compiling and say like, I'm going to do something with this, but let me just build it up first. So we're going to do like search on the next token. So that's a thing. In fact, it's like something like this. So we can, I guess we can do that, but then tokens is rest. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. I can use a better name and say remaining tokens. All right. right. Um, cool. Does that type check? It does, yeah. OK, cool. Yeah, so now I feel like yeah, even like this is a, a pretty big function, so you have to think about it. Yeah. But this is all kind of just copying and pasting. Yes. And so, like, I can be reasonably confident that this didn't change the behavior. Yeah. Um, well, should we? Uh... Should we just try calling it now from from find token and then see if yeah. our tests pass? Yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. So find token, uh, and then the first call is made with this. Aha! So now that's where we get to use this. Yeah. And then it gets the list of tokens and is token. 
Yes. Hey. <laughs> cool. Uh, wait, I think there's one. Oh, no, search is going to handle this. But we can, we can now, like, now that we've made this transformation, it opens up new ways that you can, like, tighten it up even further. But we'll get to that. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, um, okay, so we've, uh, fortunately, we have a gigantic test suite that we can run. Yeah. And uh, so let's do that. So, um, so we can do npm run uh, test e to e, and um, we have a lot of failures, but that's expected. But our output didn't change uh, because the way it works is it stores the test results and then we commit them so we can see the current passing and failing tests and nothing changed so our implementation yeah. is the same right. which uh, which we could prove uh, if we let's yeah. let's see if we can mess this up like I don't know just for fun because <laughs> yeah. what good is a test if you don't see it fail yeah, yeah. You have to see it fail at least a couple of times. Yeah. You know? like, I, think what I think Richard mentioned this, like, they for a very long time, they had zero runtime exceptions. Yeah, right. But so at some point, they had one or two, and now that we're saying, like, okay, now we're also confident that they get reported correctly. That's right. Ex point. Yeah, for years, he didn't even know if Elm runtime Maybe exceptions they, yeah. would get reported. Yeah, exactly. So, hey, we got uh, quite a few failures when we yeah. mess something up there. So that's good. Uh, it's actually running our code and seems like our, our refactor worked. First try. All right. <laughs> Very nice. So um, yeah, let's let's check on our benchmark. So now... Uh, I don't think this helps, by the way. This, this in, hasn't yet helped. In this particular um, set of examples in the benchmark. Uh, no, in general, like we're still doing the same amount of work, but this transformation makes it now easier to uh, to do a better job, essentially. Okay, okay. So, but you said that we oh, because we're still not doing, we're still processing every element in the list. We're still going until we're done, rather than yeah. being able to detect whether whether we can exit early. Exactly. Right. Then that was your whole point there. So nice. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay, well, uh, just just for fun, let's see what happens. Uh, just rerun the benchmarks until they show what you want to see. That's right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you want to get to that far edge of the bell curve where it looks like it's much better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so I've had cases where all of a sudden you get like two million, yeah, like a thousand percent improvement. Yeah. <laughs> That's when, uh, for instance, now if we were to get a, or if you, yeah, just generate an exception somewhere, it's probably going to be much faster than parsing a whole document. So oh. a failing parser would then right. be Right. Nice. Suspense. Hmm. Still kind of the same. Yep. Well, we expected that, right? Right, because we didn't. Still <laughs> it's doing the same amount of work, and yeah. Um, but I mean, we could we could commit this. It's not really any worse. Oh, but I should uh, rerun rerun the test so we get the clean test output there. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. So that's a reasonable thing to commit. I mean, it's not, it's certainly not any worse, and it's more optimizable, as you said. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so now, so now is our goal to um, exit early rather than traversing every element in the list if we have to? Yeah, I 
think that's like there, there's two things. There's the, the tuple that I think in all of the arguments that we can now get rid of, and um, the uh, kind of failing early, or no, like succeeding early. Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, just checking on the chat. Uh, Phil Philip uh, Mateus Dev is saying, do you have thoughts on using VS Code Live Share for these sessions? Ah, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> this is very educational. I O I O Palm. Thank you. I'm glad uh, glad you're enjoying it. Yeah. Um, Folkert is a fountain of knowledge on <laughs> on these optimizations. It's great. I love I love how many of these cases you you know the nitty gritty about. Um, VS Code Share. Yeah, that's a cool that's a cool idea. I like that. Um, okay. So uh, any idea on how we can check the condition for whether we can return early? So, what makes this a little hard is um, how search is kind of far away from where it's used. But uh, the first argument, the maybe token, I think as soon as that turns into a just, mm -hmm. or just that is, then we're done. Mm. Mm -hmm. Maybe token. So the and return so, value is a maybe token list token list token. So okay, yeah, let's let's see just to get a sense of it. So emphasis find token. Yeah. Maybe dot map. Okay, so its goal is to yeah. It's to find the first token. Yeah. Nice. That uh that seems reasonable and we've got a gigantic test suite. <laughs> <laughs> to support us, so let's let's yeah. try it. I like it. Okay. Um, but I think what that means is that we should kind of put the search yes. logic yes. into where it's actually used. I, I like that. Yeah. Okay. So search is used right here. So search. Actually, we can put it up one, well, yeah, we'll see. But I think we should have like an if statement in the end with two branches that both, or one of them is going to be done and the other one is going to recursively mm -hmm, call on the, mm -hmm. the rest of the tokens. Right. Right. I, I, I see what you're saying. Um, okay. Well, like I said before, I. Sometimes I find it kind of comforting to like just play around in a let. So yeah. let's try that. Next token. So yeah, I think we don't need that one anymore. So if we now assume that if we are in this function, we haven't yet found the token that we're looking for. Right? Because as soon as we are going to find it, we're going uh, to exit oh, this function. The, uh, I from see. Now so on. you're okay, you're saying that maybe ah you're saying maybe token is like we found a token. Okay, so it, it's saying if we've already found a token, then you're done. Just keep track of the work. So this is where it's doing yeah. that. It's saying search search does nothing. It just passes through the final result in this case. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So I will, like it does a little bit of work I'm seeing now. So it keeps track of the rest of the tokens that it sees, but we can just do like a list concatenation in that. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be, it's gonna be better. Okay, so, maybe so, I think, so in this case, we can split on: is this next token that we now get, is that the token that we're looking for, or not? Mm -hmm. So, so we're doing case next token instead of maybe token. So, what do we do with token? We do this. So, you, so. So you're saying we're not uh, we're not going to do well. We're going to do something else with this case. So this is this is not going to be a case right here. It's going to be more like just this code, right? It's if yeah. Okay. So if uh, and this is next token. 
Okay, so if, if next token is the kind of token we're looking for, uh, and inner tokens. We're, we are done. Inner tokens is this. Uh, what was that, Fulcrit? Well, if, if, the, if, if in this case, next token is the token we're looking for, we are done with this function. Yes. If next right. token is the token we're looking for, then we're then we're good. Uh, otherwise, we recurse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, so recursing looks like this. Find token help. Uh, oh yeah, we need the. Oh well, the the types of these are going to be different. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's just see if that it's happy with that. Okay. So. Okay. So that's valid. And then that returns something like this. So in this case, yeah, it's a just of like the token that we found. Right. Uh, ah, something like this. But actually, we should use. Yeah. So now we have to be careful because the a remaining bit. tokens. Because I think we're gonna have. To... Yeah, the remaining tokens, and also I think we have to call return in this case. Mm-hmm. Because that always was the final thing that ran, and that uh, I'm not sure. Like it refers to some of the token lists. It looks like so that's that's important as we mm -hmm. saw. So. Uh, well, we've got something that compiles. <laughs> yeah, but I'm pretty sure that... We missed something important. <laughs> well, we... Yeah, because it's still... Previously, um, if you were done in the middle, it would still add totally. all of the tokens to remain. Well, why don't we... Tokens. How about we just, um, for the heck of it... Because because we can let's just see what this does with with our giant test suite. I'm curious. Um, but yeah, I think I think you're right. We're we're not going through and appending these tokens. I think something gets left behind. I see a lot of red Fs. I think more mm -hmm, than so mm -hmm. before. Yep, I think you're right. Could be informative what they are. Uh, like, let's see. Yeah, so we got a lot of new failures, which is great because we can we can be confident that it'll catch our failures. Um, okay, so so like here's an example of a test case that's no longer passing. Uh, and actually, we can look at this. Uh, is quite handy we can go to the markdown spec and see exactly where it's failing oh yeah that's really nice that it has a isn't that nice that was that. like really hard to build that setup for it but it's so worth it and it's like yeah oh it's so, yeah. so helpful um okay so contents are parsed as inlines so there's something that's failing now with um, inline parsing, it seems like this is dealing with like backslash escaping or somehow like processing the tokens. Okay, so we've, uh, well, actually, we can, um, well, we probably really want to see, okay, example 36, let's find this. Example 36, ATX headings. Okay, so it should give the output like this. 
but it's giving output like this. So cool. <laughs> so this is kind of cool. We can we can see exactly what it's doing wrong with uh, with our change. It is not adding emphasis around this um, because the inlines it didn't keep track of uh, some something with the um, the backslash escaping. It seems like so. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so I think what you yeah. were saying, Fulkert, is right that we're we're not keeping track of the remaining tokens because we're not continuing through the list. So what what do you think we need to do here? Um, let's this this open on the second screen. So. There is a, a value called inner tokens that we get yes. passed as well. We need to combine. Oh, wait, no. It's remaining tokens it's from. Ah, yeah, okay. So we have remain tokens and remain tokens underscore, and they need to combine, I guess. Hmm. Uh huh. So remain tokens underscore are the ones that we've seen before, and remain tokens without the underscore are ones that we haven't yet seen. And now this all gets reversed, so this is going to be really tricky. But I think we should um, it should be remain tokens or list out reverse of remain tokens double plus next token cons remain tokens underscore. Wait, le okay, let me copy that. Say that again. List of. Uh, yeah, so we have a list of reverse of remain tokens. Rever okay. Oh, 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 oh. List reverse. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Uh, then a double plus. Uh, what is it? Next token, and then cons with remain tokens underscore. Uh, yeah, so you can remove the list brackets around next token. Oh, in the associative oh, oh, nice, well. nice, nice. Gotcha. Take care. And you think this will this will do it? Now, let's try. I'm not sure, but it, it's it's, it's some <laughs> combination of these three things. And some kind of reversing that um, right. is going to do it. By the way, what you can see there is that we're actually just copying the list of tokens and giving it back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not totally sure why that is, but maybe we can also short circuit that. Uh, still got some failures. Okay, so you know what I was thinking could be kind of interesting too is. Um, we could call search and compare the results. Like, let's see. Maybe that's too much trouble, but we could like log the difference if they're different or something like that. It could be, could be interesting. But yeah. maybe that's going to be more of a pain to set up than it's worth. Um, okay, so because the thing is it could like it, there could be something with um, reversing it that it shouldn't be reversed or something else here should be reversed or and it's it's hard to know because we're not getting like precise feedback. We're just getting a bunch of failures. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Oh, uh, wait, how are we? Uh, yeah, so we're. Uh, did we do the other case? Oh, wait. Um, I 
Oh, we, we're also not doing it here. Is this what you're looking at? Um, yeah, there, something is wrong, and I have to like, figure it out. So I think we only start collecting new values in, uh, in remaining tokens as soon as we've found... Oh, yeah, that also makes sense. So remaining tokens is really the, the, to the tokens that we haven't yet seen. Yes. So I think we can actually just do list of reverse remaining tokens, and the rest we don't need in here. Let's try. Uh, we've got a fast test suite. <laughs> so, yeah. Sure, at least be a step yeah. in the right direction. Like... So the first part here was really simple, right? It's mm -hmm. just copy and pasting. Now you actually have to think. Mm -hmm. And it, it does get easier over time, but it still sometimes Yeah, it would be it would be nice if there was some hard. sort of um tool uh, like where we could um test the results. Like actually I'm a fan of something called um approval testing. Where, which is where you kind of take a snapshot of the current behavior and then you can compare it. It'd be cool to like do some approval tests and then take a snapshot of the behavior and then see how, how it differs. Um, okay, so we've... But so that, that would just generate, because in theory, you should be able to do that um, in Elm to just generate a fuzzer for yeah. every function and then give yes. it some input. Yeah, I saw... Um, a demo like uh, is it Jordan had had this demo recently of, of a tool like that there might be some some opportunity to use something like that I'm not sure if it would fit exactly this problem but it's definitely definitely doable so okay let's just so maybe we should look at our search implementation again for a minute so it's going through if if this is the token we're looking for, okay, so it's only appending if it's not the token we're looking for. So inner tokens, yeah. if we f if it's the token we're looking for, then inner tokens is unchanged. So I think what the what this means is that we get a list of tokens before the one that we're interested in, then the actual token, and then the remaining. Wait, is tokens. the reversing? So this is going to reverse it every time. Maybe we're supposed to... Uh, no, it's only going to reverse it in the end. So we're going to reverse it in the case that we've already found what we want, and then return is going to uh, reverse it again, because that is what it did before. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And like, yes, we can clean right. that up, but I don't think we should do that right now, because we might like dig a hole that is even deeper than the one we're in right now. So Okay, so... But I think something with inner tokens is not right. Or might... Well, hmm. But it should be. Inner tokens... This adds, adds the next, next token, token to it. it. This just preserves inner tokens. So in this if statement, it preserves inner tokens here, and it appends the current token here. So that's the same. Um, yeah. Maybe token. Actually, it's not a it just token. Oh, is this? What is maybe token? Should this oh, be just? Oh yeah, I think. Yeah, because return is going to check for that. So we can also clean that up yeah. in a bit. But return is currently checking that that is. Ooh, hey, that's adjusted. more green. That is more green. See if it's yeah. enough green. Uh, oh, uh, that looks good, right? I think so. Did you not? I think so. Let me rerun it. Okay. Hey! Yes! Nice! Nice! Okay, okay nice. so now we've got something that we can uh, benchmark again. Should we, should we run the profile? I think we can do a little bit more okay. before. 
like we don't want it, want another like oh yeah we have 10 runs per second and okay better. well then let before we uh before we do a next step just since that was a hard earned refactor let's uh, uh -huh. let's commit this uh, -huh. uh and we can get rid of this guy search is now unused uh, we could we could do yeah. some cleanup, but that's that's good enough for a commit. So um, inline fold uh, and search call. And uh, Philip was saying in the chat, I wonder if uh, Aaron Wunderhaar's yeah. refactoring tool could have some some helpers like inlining um, inlining fold Ls and it would be it would be cool to have the ability to like turn pipe syntax into like. Uh, in invoking with parentheses sort of thing too. Just a bunch of inlining. Yeah, that would yeah. be really helpful, especially I guess with this this kind of the first step that we did, where it really is inlining to fold and it's mechanical. Kind of just yeah. copy paste. It should be able right. to do that. Especially, I mean, that's one of the things that I, I find so exciting about Elm is when you're dealing with just pure functions. Um, you can really have fun with it with static analysis tools or, you know, doing all sorts of clever tricks where you can prove that it's not doing anything um, non-deterministic, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so... Okay, so so what... We're returning... We're returning early now, right? But you still think it's not going to have uh, significant performance improvements? You think we can do more? There's some low-hanging okay. fruit okay. right here. Cool. cool. So that return right there, I uh -huh. think we can get rid nice. of. So if you look at what it's doing, it's going to maybe.map. So it's going to check that the maybe token is, in fact, a just. Uh, but it is. We know that for sure, because we wrap it in a just on line 214. Nice. So that is not required. Yes. And then it's going to reverse some lists. And we see that uh, for the remain tokens or remaining tokens, we're going to do a double reverse. And that is the same as nothing, doing nothing to it. Right. So we can get rid of it. So, well. so basically, you're saying let's inline this, right? So inline, yeah. so uh, maybe token. So, may, so, OK, so in this case, maybe token is just token. So you're saying if maybe token is a just <laughs> token, and then maybe map, it's the same as just taking the token just like this. So we can basically just yeah. um, do this, but so it's calling it like remain token. So actually, let's actually just like mechanically step through this. Remain tokens is yeah. this. Inner tokens is this. Token is next token. Uh, and then this is all adjust. So I, I just inlined it. That's like yeah. mechanical, right? Like I can rerun the tests and that's exactly the same. So now we can say, well, we're doing reverse twice. That feels good. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, so our tests are still green. And then... Nice. I think that is... That's fun. Okay. I like that. Okay, so let's do the same process here. So, well, here it's nothing. Find... Oh, wait. Sorry. Find token help. No, we're not doing return. No, no, no. We're good. We. Oh, return here. Okay. Here we're doing return on maybe token. So here we... Yeah, but we also use remain tokens underscore there, which I think is wrong. Right, because in the recursive case, that will be empty, or not? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, we would never have added to that. But I suppose we never do. It's probably fine, then. Um, but in this case, you know that maybe token is going to be nothing, right? Because none of the tokens matched. Yeah, can we get proof from the... Why don't why doesn't the compiler tell us that we we know that next to why are we taking the maybe token for or co oh because you're saying the way that we're processing this if the token if we had found a token we would have just returned it already 
and exited. So yeah. you're saying if we arrive at this point, we don't we no longer need to keep track of this data even, maybe token. Exactly. Maybe token can just go. So the, okay, basically. so actually what this represents is this is we got to the very end and we didn't find a token. So you're saying we can just say nothing here. Because yeah. We would oh no, you can just do nothing. This whole, that line, whole line is nothing, can just be if nothing. we do nothing here, then this is going to be nothing, and then we're going to maybe map nothing, which is nothing. So this is nothing. You're nothing to me. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> cool. And then and then this is no longer needed. That that's elegant. Cool. Yeah. Uh, let's make sure. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. So how are you feeling about the performance, Fulker? Is there still low hanging fruit here? Yeah, there's there's one more thing. So we can uh, instead of passing a, mm -hmm. a three tuple, which can now be a two tuple, mm -hmm. I think, it's better to just pass them as separate nice. arguments. And actually, like, do we need? Are we using all these arguments? We're not. We're not using maybe token, so we're no longer even tracking maybe token no. or remain tokens. So that's an yeah. even better optimization. Oh, we can, yeah, we can just remove yeah. them all together. Yeah. And this is a nice way you can just change the type signature and then yeah. you can just follow the errors everywhere. Totally. Yeah. Okay, let's let's run our end-to-end -end tests. Ooh. Yeah. Nice. Nice, nice. And then I think if you compare, this is actually shorter than yes. it was. So And easier to like, read. I feel like this is just a win in in, in along yeah. all No, this dimensions. is an example that if the performance was exactly the same, I it's still nicer to look at. I would prefer this. Yeah. This is great. You can clean up some of the, uh, the underscores in the names. Nice. Right? Uh, it's just inner tokens. Yeah. yeah um, I also like that, like when you do a refactoring, and then you remove maybes and you remove arguments that are no longer consumed. That's a huge win, just in terms of like you've eliminated certain cases that you don't have to think about in your code anymore. Like that's one of the the things that. I'm always looking for an Elm is how can I make the types more specific and possible to express less data. There's less to think about that could go wrong then, you know. Um, okay. It's also like this is where extensible records are very nice when you can just say like, I, I only need these fields. I don't need a full model, only right. a couple of fields. Right. So, okay. Have we, have we gotten the low hanging fruit? Yeah, I think this is this, okay. is, this feels good now. Like it feels nice. Let's, I'm going to commit that just because we worked hard to get to that point. So, um, refactor find token function to return early when it finds a token. And yeah, I looked around. Like this function is used in a bunch of places. So, I don't know. I would like to see an improvement, but I'm not sure how much inline parsing it actually does in the example document right. that we have. Uh, although, I did try it earlier and just uh, cut out the inline parser altogether. Mm -hmm. And in the bottom benchmark, that got like 4,000 runs per second. So, that's our so, upper bound on how, how much we could possibly optimize yeah. it. Yeah. That's that's always good to know, because if the if the upper bound is like a one percent improvement, you're you're not gonna hit the upper bound. So <laughs> yeah, it's gonna yep. be frustrating. Yep. No, that's that's really we should we should emphasize that for this performance tuning because we're this is kind of a don't try this at home unless you like unless you have a good reason to. If it's package code, it's being exercised a lot. If you if you are maintaining a parser package, then by all means. Do this stuff, but benchmark it. It actually works. Uh, oh. 
Did we mess up some? Just run it again. <laughs> did we mess up some um, tail call stuff? Oh, uh, did you compile it? I did. Okay. Huh. Well. I'll try. Yeah, I'm sure you can find a benchmark where the difference is really stark. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. So if um, what it's what that algorithm was doing was it was going through tokens. If we had inlines with a bunch of different inlines, I mean, let's do that. Let's do that, and then we can run that benchmark before and after and compare it. That would be interesting. Yeah. Mm, I'm just trying it in Chrome to see if it's any different. <laughs> uh, Actually, Brave also uses WebKit, yes. right? Yeah, it's pretty similar to the hood. So, hmm. yeah, similar results. Um, so it's like, it's marginally slower. Um, but... I, I wouldn't call them significant, actually. Significantly slower? On this scale. I don't, you don't think th it's yeah, significantly I, slower. I agree, I, I agree. So, okay, let's, let's make a benchmark that's going to um, exercise this a little better. That's going to show us <laughs> what we want to see, right? Exactly. So... Really long in line. I think it's just many in lines, like complicated yeah. in lines. Um. Because with this kind of micro benchmark that you're setting up mm -hmm. now, even the change of having the tuple versus passing the argument separately should show up, basically. Because mm -hmm. if you... Uh, like, <laughs> basically, if you run it often enough in this kind of small setting, then then that kind of thing will matter. So I know that um, Andre, who writes yes. on physics, I, he is crazy, crazy, but he, the code quality and the, like, the looks of it do suffer there from his efforts to make yes. it run very fast. And so he does all kinds of tricks like this to minimize using tuples and re using records, etc. just writing functions that have a lot of arguments just because like, mm -hmm. it's not pretty, but yes. it is fast. Right. Totally. Yeah. And you've got to, you've got to make that call for yourself. But when, yeah, when a lot of users are depending on it and they're doing very performance intensive stuff, then it's, it's nice. Um, right. Okay. I'm going to run this and then I'll take a picture of it and then we'll, uh, go back in our commit history to the old version of the code and see. It would be kind of cool to have like a project that allows you to um, work on the code side by side with your old implementation and then compare the performance as you're changing yeah. it. That's yeah, so it hard, hard though. Especially with Elm, because you can't do all this like metaprogramming stuff. Yeah, like as soon as you change a type somewhere, that just becomes more trouble yep. than it's worth. Yep. So I, I often do this. For instance, the, the thing that I showed with jump if versus, yep. uh, versus symbol, like that's something that is small and self-contained that you can just quickly right. check out. Uh, but 
like with real code. And like you have to find some kind of weird name, like my function two, and then hook it I up. Know. And... I know it's yeah. I mean, it's ideal if it's like one function that you know is the performance bottleneck, and then you want to compare two implementations. That's that's doable. Yeah. Uh, well, but but I feel like only if you can actually just copy them out of the file mm -hmm, where they're right. currently in. Uh, into the benchmark mm -hmm, program. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. So I want... Uh, what's the file we're touching here? Uh, inline parser. Okay. So I want... I know, yes. uh, like Philip is saying that uh, fold R is optimized, but that's actually it has to be optimized because it's slower than fold L by default. So fold mm -hmm. L, you can, as we've now kind of done, you can express very nicely as a tail recursive function because uh, fold L starts from the left or it associates to the left. It's kind of uh, Hard to explain, but for fold R to make any progress, you need the final element of the list. So you need to go all the way to the right before you can actually apply the the function that you're mm -hmm. folding with. Mm -hmm. And so that means you can't really do that in a in a tail recursive way. Uh, so what they do is, uh, well, they have some tricks to to make sure that. Uh, that fold R is kind of comparable in speed to fold L up to some high number, and then they do the slow version again. And like, not the slow version, they reverse the list, they use fold mm -hmm. L, and then they... I see. Oh, really? Uh, That's interesting. Cool. Yeah, just so they don't... Uh, like, it doesn't cause runtime yeah. exceptions. Right. Interesting. Well, this is taking longer to run than <laughs> it feels longer than. Uh, so this is running with the the code before we started our coding session today. So uh, it feels longer. It's I terrible. To go so the left is way. before and the right is after. So let's see. Uh, before that. Well. Would actually be slower. No, it's this is where you really need to compare them. No, no, this is our after on the right. So it's oh, okay. It's faster. Oh, that's nice. Then. Um, yeah. Yeah. But not not significant. Not well. I mean, I think yeah. that makes sense because the number of nodes that we have here is very small. Exactly. Right. So if you exit early. It only well, saves right. a little. That's, that's the thing. If you're doing performance testing on a small sample set, then you're going to exaggerate the um, the overhead of, like, setup tasks and, like, boilerplate and things like that. But what we want is, like, no, if you're dealing with, like, a markdown file that may actually cause performance issues, like, I mean... <laughs> like, well, you know what? Uh, we could even just like duplicate this, right? <laughs> Why yeah. not? Always the fun thing. In fact, if we wanted to, we could like programmatically <laughs> duplicate the line. I guess you can uh, like string dot. Yeah, beat. let's do that. Why not? We're programmers. A little yeah. cleaner. We don't need copy paste. You know what? Let's go big. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll see it. You'll notice it then. You can also maybe uh, comment out some of the other benchmarks. 
so we only run the one yeah. that we're interested in. That sounds like a good idea. Speeds up the process mm -hmm. a little bit. I like that. Cool. Um, yeah, I think that's a good test case to highlight what we spent time optimizing. Oh, Philip is saying 2.7% speed up. So I guess that is no that that is noticeable, huh? Oh, in our case, right? Two hundred, or what is it? A good hundred. Yeah, two hundred runs per second more. But here you're comparing numbers between different runs, which should be possible. But now, like, there's there's error yep. bars on that number. Yeah. But you know, like the code is nicer now, and That's it's right. a little bit faster. I think. It, I mean, of course, you hope for big wins, big gains, but yeah. uh, that's made very difficult because of because of the parser and because we can't really see where time is spent. <laughs> Page is unresponsive. <laughs> I might I might have gone overboard um, with repeat a thousand. Maybe you. Huh? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> All right, fine. Repeat a hundred. Also, Elm benchmark is uh, is not that great when one run of your test takes mm. a long time because it demands uh, a certain statistical precision. So what it does up front is it runs your test a number of times and it sees it looks at the variation in the times and based on that it picks the number of times to run your benchmark. Yeah. And of course, if your uh, test runs a long time, then the absolute difference in runtime for your tests or for your benchmarks is yeah. going to be quite large. And so then it also demands a very large number uh, of times that your benchmark needs to be run. Right. And and it, it yeah, it can freeze, huh. and you have to kind of close the tab somehow. Interesting. See here, someone is saying that even the currently logged in username can change yeah. numbers significantly. And yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing where yeah, you don't want to be dealing with that. Yeah. And hopefully you are. And, yeah, uh, you, you want to um, remove the stati statistical noise as much as possible. And um, I mean, you know, yeah, like testing is the same with any kind of testing, whether it's like performance testing or unit testing or end-to-end -end testing, smoke testing, security testing, like all tests are not created equal. If you are, um, you know, you could, you could have lots of, I've seen lots of code bases that have tons of unit tests and they're not nice to work and you don't feel confident changing them. You know, you could have performance tests and they don't, test the right thing like you have to test the right thing you have to reduce the isolate the variables and the things that you want to really measure that's not easy that there's an art to that and it's worth it's actually yeah. worth putting as much thought if not more into like how you set up the benchmarking you know because mm -hmm. otherwise yeah you're flying and so, blind. yeah that's why it's yeah and we're kind of flying <laughs> blind right now yeah or you know, we're flying on my prior experience with optimizing Elm programs. Right, right. Which is not not entirely blind, but I would much rather have like a, a, a like a, a DevTools profile that very clearly pointed out like this is where right. you spend your time. Mm -hmm. Well, I. I hope that bar goes by fa oh yep yeah, okay I like I like this it's slow uh, this is the one we're trying to beat so that's good <laughs> that should be possible yeah um oh. Okay, so now we're running it with our optimized code. I'll put this on the side for reference. Here we go. <laughs> so
It's loading the page. Yeah, sometimes it just I can't even get the renders yeah. in. There's actually explicit code in, in the benchmark runner to give, uh, like, it freezes for zero seconds, so it can update the animation uh -huh. for the, like, wow. do a few huh. call. Interesting. Uh, so, yeah, otherwise it would just lock. Um, the inter you yeah. know, it's interesting, too, with Elm, because, because of its purity, um, and, you know, immutability and purity, you can, like, you could parallelize things like crazy. So it'll be interesting to see if there are any developments in that area with, you know, like, I mean, like Elixir, like Phoenix compared to Rails, um, which is, like, built on the Erlang VM. It's, like, the data is immutable and the runtime there. And so you can parallelize all these processes in the Phoenix web server framework. And it's similar to Rails conceptually, but way more performant and way more scalable because of that um, immutable nature. So it would be cool to see if the web gets the ability to like, maybe some WebAssembly stuff that allows you to parallelize things or something. Yeah, the web doesn't no, really have that right now. No, JavaScript by its nature is, is, is uh, single-threaded, yeah. But this is why Evan is so kind of adamant about certain guarantees mm -hmm. of the language. It's like, if you have those guarantees, you can actually optimize in a way that is, ah, see, this is like, in terms of percentages. 7.7% 7 .7 increase. That's pretty good. That's, that's yeah. success. Uh, I think, like you know, if you can, if you can make all of your parts seven percent faster, that's, that's a good. That's good. a good day's work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is great. So I think. Um, uh, yeah. Thanks for. Nice. Thanks for sharing the video, V Victor. I'll definitely check that out. That sounds cool. Um, so I think this is a good. I, I think this is a good day's work for our performance benchmarking. I think like probably some next steps, you know, things to to work on in the future. Maybe I'll uh, do some work on this. Is I think it would be really cool to get um, our suite of benchmarks a little more um, expressive. You know, actually going through some meaningful cases where people would perceive performance bottlenecks, right? Cause, I mean, because really that's what you want, right? You want, you want to say, what, what would users experience? There's, there's sort of like the main path, what would users experience? And then there's like the, uh, you know, extreme cases, but because they're extreme, they're important. Like if, if the happy path for users is a really happy path and everything works fine, that's great. But if like, and then in that case, if there are extreme cases where the performance is really problematic, it's worth optimizing those. So you want your benchmarks to capture those, right? So yeah. um, that's something I'm gonna be thinking about is how can, how can we get a nice suite of benchmarks because I think that's really important for this project especially like I would love for this to be like a community project that can be used um, you know for like the Elm package documentation site and things like that so we have a pure Elm implementation of markdown parsing and that makes it all the more important as a community resource to to have a nice suite of benchmarks so we can like keep the performance solid over time and um, and Fulcrid, you also have this project you're working on for like a CLI-based benchmark. That yeah. would be amazing because then we can run that yeah. in our CI and we can see if there's like a large increase in, in, you know, how long things are taking to run. We can get a warning. Yeah, so I was talking with Philip about running benchmarks in CI, which apparently because those aren't usually the most powerful machines, you can get some weird numbers yeah. out of that. It's apparently possible, but you have to be kind of careful with that. 
But something it, it does enable is uh, filtering benchmarks. So right now what you would have to do is have a, a whole file of benchmarks, which actually gets kind of messy. But I don't think you could run them all in one go because your browser would just freeze. Uh, and then so so that means you have to kind of break it up and then comment out or, or select whatever um, part of the benchmarks that you want mm. to actually run. Then you have to always remember to turn on dash dash optimize because mm -hmm. otherwise mm -hmm. <laughs> bad yeah. things happen. Uh, so I, I think that CLI tool can really make the the process of using benchmarks yes. better. And then I think you could, on your own machine, maybe keep a record of the performance details, statistics over time. Mm -hmm. Exa not, exactly, yeah. yeah. We'll have to see whether it works in CI. Yeah, I mean, basically. if you think about I, I always like to take the system perspective. If you look at it as a system, then um, over time, how will your performance evolve if you have that feedback loop? If you have this feedback loop where your performance changes significantly for better or for worse. If you find out about that right as you're changing your code, like maybe there's a, a test watcher that's running your not only your unit tests and your end-to-end -end tests, like the, the markdown spec tests, but performance tests. And you can see when there's a jump in performance. Well, now you're not going to keep going down that path and find out like months later, oh, there's a performance issue. Like the second you introduce something that's causing issues, you you know about it. So, yeah. You could at least flag them early. Yes. That is, that, exactly. That would be nice. I think other, other languages do this as well. So you, you just have to be a little bit careful with it, but uh, it can certainly help. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting space to explore. Well, um, thanks so much, Fulkert, for, for joining the stream. This was a ton of fun. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, be excited to see how yeah. this evolves. Yeah, well, nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks a lot for fun. joining. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, oh, yeah, we've got yeah. a couple streams coming up. Uh, so incrementalelm.com slash live. We've got... Uh, Wolfgang Schuster is going to be on the stream. Yeah. He works at Square. And uh, a few weeks back, Luke Westby and I worked on uh, something with the Square API to build a local app for, for our local farmer's market to do delivery. Uh, so uh, Wolfgang and I will be following up on that and do, adding some Square payments. It'll be great to have his uh, knowledge on, on that to help me navigate through the API. Um, and then... Uh, Andrew Crouch and I are going to be uh, brushing up my JSON decoder cones project on May 18th. So uh, stay tuned for those. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. See you next time. Thanks again, Fulkert. Bye, everybody. Yeah, see ya.